Right, now we're going to look at Alpharis 10, paragraph 23, where we have a subsidiary that will remain a subsidiary. Now, the standard indicates to us that when we have a subsidiary that remain a subsidiary, therefore, the entity will, for example, sell a portion of the shares, but this will still be a subsidiary. Or scenario number two, where the entity will purchase additional shares, but those will still remain a subsidiary. That we will recognize a change in equity transaction. This change in equity will be our change in ownership, and this will be included in our statement of changes in equity. Therefore, if you think about your statement of changes in equity, you will have an additional column. You will have your share capital, your retained earnings, revaluation surplus, and now you will have a change in ownership column where you will have to include this change. What is important to identify is when there is a change in ownership, you will have to apply RFRS 10 B96. This paragraph indicates to us that changes in proportion held by the NCI, the entity shall recognize directly in equity any difference between the amount by which your NCI are adjusted and the fair value of the consideration paid or received and attributable to the owners of the parent. Therefore, that difference should be recognized as your change in equity in your statement of changes in equity. Okay, so how do we actually then calculate this? If you look at the number one, the amount by which our NCI will be adjusted. Now, my recommendation, this is how I prefer to look at this. I will look at this in terms of the amount before the change relating to my NCI and the amount after the change relating to my NCI. And this will be the difference, the amount by which my NCI will be adjusted. And then second, the fair value in terms of our consideration received or paid, the consideration got, and then this difference will be the amount to be recognized in your change in ownership. In this example, we have a subsidiary that remain a subsidiary by purchasing an additional 10% in Entity B. Entity A acquired 80% in Entity B on 1 January 2020 at a cost of 80,000, which is deemed to be the fair value on that date. Then Entity A acquired an additional 10% in Entity B on 1 July 2021 for 20,000. Therefore, immediately we're able to identify subsidiary 80,000, sorry, 80% 80 plus 10%, 90% remains to be a subsidiary. Entity B recognized a profit of 15,000 for the year in the 31 December 2020. And Entity B recognized a profit for the six-month period till 30 June 2021 of 50, 000, sorry, of 5,000. The net asset value of Entity B was 120,000 on date of disposal. Entity A accounts for investments in associates and subsidiaries at cost in its separate financial statements in terms of IS27 paragraph 10A. And Entity A elected to measure non-controlling interest at proportionate share of the subsidiary's net identifiable assets. Year end 31 December, ignore all taxes and assume no consolidation occurred on date of changing control. Perform your journal entries. Now, as always, our step number one, we have identified that they've purchased 80%. Remember, this was for 80,000. And then they've purchased an additional 10% for 20,000. And this is 90%, therefore still a subsidiary. Immediately we identify we need to apply RFRS 10, paragraph 23, and then B96 in terms of our calculation. Step one completed. Now let's refer to step two. Right, now as always, I want you to focus. Look at the top of your timeline, the separate entities records, entity A. In the records of Entity A, as per IS27 paragraph 10A, we need to recognize the investment at cost. Okay, guys, I'm pretty sure you know this by now. Therefore, at initial recognition date, 
we will have to debit the investment with the 80,000 credit bank. Now, on 1 July 2021, Entity A purchased an additional 10%. Therefore, in the records of Entity A, we will debit the investment increase with 20,000. It's still a subsidiary. Right, now, when you look at the timeline, you agree with me that this remains to be a subsidiary from 1 January 2020 up until whenever they sell everything. But on 1 July 2021, there is a change in ownership and we've identified that we will have to apply RFRS 10 paragraph 23 change in ownership because the subsidiary remains a subsidiary. And we need to make use of B96 in terms of our calculation. Right. Now, if we look at this, you agree with me that this is a subsidiary, therefore, as of 1 January 2020, we will have to follow our principles of RFRS 3 and RFRS 10 and our group records. But due to the change in ownership, on 1 July 2021, we now need to apply RFRS 10 B96. Therefore, when we look at our steps, what do we need to do? Guys, take us one step back first for me. If you think about this, from whom will Entity A purchase the 10%? From the NCI. Therefore, it does make sense that our NCI will have to decrease. Therefore, according to our calculation to determine the change, we will have to determine what is our NCI's value before the change versus what is the NCI's value after the change, right? Now, when we look at the scenario, very similar to the previous two guys, we are able to identify the net asset value is the 120,000 on 1 July 2021. And if you calculate this backwards by determining your opening balance, guys, which we have done previously, it's the 120,000 minus the 5,000 profit for the year minus the 15,000 retained earnings, we were able to determine that this is 100,000. Therefore, our net asset value on 1 January 2020 is 100,000, of which 80% is allocated to the parent and 20% to our NCI. What do we need to calculate? We need to calculate what is the NCI's value before the change. It is the 20,000 plus 3,000 plus 1,000. Therefore, this will be 24,000 and this relates to 20%. And what will 10% be then? Therefore, 10% will be the 24,000 times 10 over 20 or divide by 2. And this will be 12,000. Therefore, we are able to determine our NCI will have to decrease with 12,000. Okay, but let's just stop. We're still busy with B96 on the right side. The amount by which our NCI will be adjusted. Yes, we've calculated that. Then number two, the fair value of the consideration paid. We need to determine which is our number two. What's the fair value of the consideration paid? They've provided this to us. It's the 20,000. Therefore, the difference will be 8,000. And that is the amount that should be included in our change in ownership. Right. Now, in terms of a journal entry, let's have a look at this. If we think about this, our NCI will decrease debit or credit side. Debit side. Therefore, debit our NCI as the NCI will decrease with 12,000. Right. Credit what we will credit the investment in the subsidiary with a 20,000 and we will debit our change in ownership account now statement of changes in equity with our 8,000 and that's it guys but now I'm pretty sure you're thinking, but why do we credit the investment and subsidiary? Remember, take it back to basics. 
When we include our at acquisition journal, guys, we credit the investment in the subsidiary. If you look at the journal at the top in our separate records, in our separate records, they've debited this investment with the 20,000. Therefore, when we consolidate, what do we do? Let me just write this down again. When we consolidate, we add the parent. Therefore, in the parent's records, we've added this 20,000. And we add our subsidiary, all of the assets and liabilities. Therefore, this is included in our group, the 20,000. And we now need to include our journal to take this out. Why take it out? Because we already have all of the assets and liabilities, the equity included in our group of the subsidiary. If we don't include this journal to take out the 20,000, we are double counting 